Okay. I'll make you the presenter. Okay, I'll start with this one. Now let's go back in time to this patient who's got a pacemaker device in. And I'm going to make this one big. I don't have my mouse with me and I'm not used to using a trackpad, so just bear with me. Uh, the findings are here are really subtle, but you'll see when I show you imaging exams from later on here in 2017 that there is a peribronchial fluid cuff or two perhaps in the right lung. And I'm not sure if there is a few septal lines in the right lung at that time, but it is, and again, this is really subtle, but it is asymmetric right rather than left. So let's go forward in time. And here is 20, 19. And perhaps again, there's a peribronchial fluid cuff or two, maybe up here a septal line or two or three, but again, subtly asymmetric on the right side. I was reading um, some of his notes as I went along and saw one of the things that he had had for a long time was a unilateral right pleural effusion that wasn't really explained. Here we are in January of 2019. And I hope you can appreciate, particularly up here, that we have interstitial edema, peribronchial fluid cuffs, some septal lines, peribronchial fluid cuffs. Now we have bilateral abnormality, but it's asymmetrically severe. There is more lung water. Look at these peribronchial fluid cuffs in the right upper lobe, particularly, and subpleural edema compared to the left lung. Nice demonstration of peribronchial fluid cuffs of interstitial edema in relation to those airways and right pleural fluid. Now, I don't know whether he has a cause for left atrial hypertension, but now we're going to take a look and see why the edema is asymmetric. Now, these are noisy images, but let me go from here down. We have a lot of calcification within right paratracheal mediastinal lymph nodes, precoronal, a lot. And then when we get here in particular, we'll see there's soft tissue opacity in the right suprahyla region as well. Let me go forward in time now to say here, now this is 2019 as well. And let's look for that right superior pulmonary vein. So we see a nicely opacified left superior pulmonary vein. We see the abnormal tissue in the right suprahyalar region. And yes, we can see some pulmonary vein here, but it's not well opacified. So this is a really nice example of the phenomenon of a granulomatous fibrosing mediastinitis or right suprahyalitis clearly affecting the right superior pulmonary vein in particular and producing more right upper lobe pulmonary venous hypertension that has an influence on lung edema. So I think that's a nice explanation for the asymmetry of the edema, presumably for the right pleural effusion that's chronic. And we've shown quite a few cases like this, interestingly, um, here in our webinar over time. Jeff, do you agree? Yes, and this is a particularly nice case. Yeah, yeah, very nice example of that. 
It's interesting. So, I was recently think, reading about fibrosing uh, mediastinitis, and it's a very slowly progressive process, like millimeters sometimes per year. Yeah. So a nice demonstration of that phenomenon. Here's a nice companion case. So this is a person that really came to us from the outside and was basically described as being an acute hypoxic respiratory failure. He has a chest radiograph on the 19th and I'll show you some CT images as well in a moment. But in terms of radiography on the 19th, he's clearly got extensive abnormality in his right lung compared to the left lung. And of course, it's hard to disentangle exactly what this represents. It's pulmonary abnormality. There's also some pleural abnormality. But once we look at the CT, we can understand why this looks the way it does. So as we go here, starting up here, very nice demonstration of the septal lines of interstitial lung edema, florid. But then we also have ground glass attenuating opacity in that right upper lobe consistent with alveolar edema. And we see a small focus there, but it's clearly again asymmetric. There's a lot more certainly ground glass opacity of alveolar edema in the right upper lobe. Here again, right upper lobe, right central lung, definitely asymmetric edema and particularly so in the right upper lobe, but there's edema everywhere. Very nice demonstration of interstitial edema, bilateral pleural effusions. So what is the cause or typical textbook cause or explanation potentially of acute lung edema, but particularly extensive in the right upper lobe? And we've shown a few cases before, but this is the nicest one that I've seen, I think for sure of that, which is mitral valve regurgitation incompetence. And I'm gonna show you here that the asymmetry of the edema there and the persistent asymmetry of edema even after surgery. So here is the up report, they did discover this and diagnose this on ultrasound, but confirmed here, acute severe regurgitation, rupture cordy to the posterior leaflet, acute respiratory failure, and you can see the procedure that they did. So a really nice example of that. Why the persistent edema even after surgery? One can just speculate. If you have acute, severe capillary hypertension, you can get the phenomenon called stress failure of the pulmonary capillaries, a form of acute lung injury, or at least injury to the pulmonary endothelium. And in fact, John West, who described that phenomenon, showed micrographs, as well as in animal models, of an acute injury to the, not just the stress failure of the pulmonary capillaries, but to the thin side of the alveolar capillary barrier with little holes basically in that side of the alveolar capillary barrier. So locally, one can easily speculate that we have a protein rich edema. We have a form of acute lung injury edema in the right upper lobe <clears throat> because of that phenomenon. And if I'm correct, it's gonna take more time for this to heal maybe more time for the relative protein-rich lung edema up here to go away compared to the other areas. So a really nice case of, of that phenomenon. That is really nice. Thank you, Howard. Yeah. This one is um, a funny kind of case. Um, I saw it the other day. I'm going to bring up this patient and I will show you one image, which is this one. And I was reading bedside radiographs and I knew that this patient had a very complicated history going back many years um, of congenital heart disease and a co-optation 
and apparently either an iatrogenic or somehow related interruption of the blood supply to the left lung for which a stent was placed. In spite of that, he still has persistent episodes of hemoptysis coming from the left lung, has had embolization procedures involving the left hemithorax, so a very complicated history, and he is in the ICU. And I was reading bedside radiographs in the usual fashion, and I'll give you a moment to look at this and tell you that the finding is not related to that abnormal hemithorax. Let me make this a bit big, and I wasn't quite sure of the finding right off, so I'm going to make this big and pay attention to the tracheostomy tube. Let me just pan down here. And it's the one on the right side that I was perplexed about. So what I observed was this tracheostomy tube really does look like it's not quite centered relative to the tracheal air column here. Here it does. And it's two days difference between the two. So I caught up the physician and he said, well, I'm not aware that the patient has respiratory distress at this moment, but I, I'll get back to you. Didn't hear back for a while, but then later on I did hear back. And it turned out that this was real, that the tracheostomy tube actually wasn't properly in the trachea. Now he's still breathing and still able to um, inspire, of course, even though the tracheostomy tube is not in the lumen, but things became a bit complicated when they had difficulty attaching him to the ventilator to bring him down for a CTA for the hemoptysis. But it's real. And um, they thought it either got displaced or was in a paratracheal tract, but it wasn't centered in the lumen. And they actually just took that out and he did okay. So this is really unusual but it does happen. I think this is the second case I've seen in my career. Interesting. So, is that one of, that's a, the ones I'm used to seeing, I think are the shyly ones that are the thick white plastic ones that will, um, is this one of the more flexible ones? Are they more, I, I don't, um, are they more prone to dislodging? I don't know. I don't know which one it is. It looks very. It's, it looks like there's barely any of it in there after the ink, the sort of the bend. And it usually it, it looks like an upside down L, and the long stem is more intratracheal. Yeah, it is curious, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that's a good pickup, Howard. Yeah, it was. I almost kind of dismissed it as an observation because it's unusual, and I'm not even quite sure why I actually saw it or perceived it. But there you are. It was real, so it happens once in a really big while. Well, that's cool. Now, sometimes it may be associated with substantial respiratory distress, depending on how dependent the patient is on that assistance. But like in this person, not as much. All right. Okay, those are mine. Thank you. David, I see you've joined. Do you have any cases this week? I do, but I need a couple of minutes. Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, all right, I have three sort of related cases and one just nice example of something unrelated. So I'll start with this one. This is a middle-aged uh, woman who has refractory acute myelogenous leukemia. And um, she had had a previous acute lung injury that had resolved, but on this follow-up imaging, um, this big mass here appeared and wasn't there two weeks ago. And you can see it's got very ill-defined margins, kind of fuzzy there. On the lateral view, you can see, we can see it anteriorly here. So um, when I see a big mass and someone is neutropenic, I worry about bad bugs, uh, fungus in particular. And when really big, I think about mucor. Um, so they did a CT scan at this point, um, and we have a very nice example of a bird's nest, which we've shown lots of examples of, but it's still not well known, uh, so always good to share. 
you see this peripheral consolidation. There's some more lucent center in it. And then there's even some ground glass around it. It looks like it's probably crossing the fissure, def well, definitely crossing the fissure into the lower lobe there as well. Um, and so interestingly, they did a, a bronchoscopy and a BAL. Uh, they had started the patient on amphotericin uh, immediately because of the concern. Um, but they only recovered actinomyces, which was suspect to me because that's usually from bad teeth and doesn't show up very quickly and tends to smolder, even in neutropenic patients. And I've not seen actinomyces cause something this sort of hazy looking. It's usually more fibrotic or sort of just kind of creeping in. Um, so because it didn't fit, they ended up doing a biopsy and they identified the mucor on the biopsy in here. So this ended up being mucor. And what's kind of impressive is this scan was done um, five days later and you can see just how this thing blew up rather quickly, which is also um, a feature of, of an aggressive fungus. And then there's a new lesion in the right lower lobe as well. So really ugly mucor with a really big bird's nest. And this almost qualifies as an airy, right, David? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. And now I have three, three cases that are related to each other. Um, so this is a 73-year-old male who has a history of um, rheumatoid arthritis. And he has an interesting pattern of lung disease. Uh, we typically think of UIP or UIP-like pattern. You can see there's some emphysema. But he has some subpleural fibrosis and some traction bronchiectasis and what looks like honeycomb cysts in a few areas. And then some of these funny, funnier cysts. It's very asymmetric. And, and unlike most RA cases, it's not really basal predominant. So there's a little bit in that right base. So it's more right lung and it seems to be a little bit more upper lobe. Um, so if you didn't have an RA history, you might think about hypersensitivity pneumonitis, although the relatively normal central lung, I think, is, would be unusual for that. But an unusual pattern of fibrosis always makes me think about connective tissue disease. If we jump ahead uh, about eight years or so, it's clearly progressed, and it's a nice example of this so-called exuberant honeycombing, which uh, Jonathan Chung and his colleagues described s several years ago. Um, is seeming more prevalent in patients with uh, connective tissue disease, particularly rheumatoid arthritis. Interesting, it never really has that UIP look. It stays sort of very upper lung predominant on the right. The left lung is more sort of mid-zone predominant in the lingula here. Um, and then the right lung just became much more diffuse, but it has that exuberant honeycombing without really that intermediate stage of reticulation and, and stuff. So um, one pattern of connective tissue disease associated uh, lung fibrosis, and this was RA. I'll show the coronal. I think this is the old coronal here, and you can see yeah, that really that striking asymmetry and unusual pattern. And then this is the um, they didn't do a new coronal, but here I can make one real quickly. Sort of a not a great resolution, but you can see the see the distribution. And then this is another manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis, and this one's a little bit milder. So this patient had obstructive physiology on pulmonary function testing. And I think one of the probably under-recognized or under-diagnosed complications of rheumatoid arthritis is constrictive bronchiolitis. And it may be that in many cases, it's it's subclinical or it's, it's, it's very subtle. But if we look on the inspiratory images, you can see there's a subtle mosaic attenuation. There's areas of decreased attenuation, slightly smaller vessels, kind of patchy on both sides. Lung volumes are preserved, so it's not hypo or hyperinflated, um, but that heterogeneity persists throughout. And then we did do some expiratory images, which if I can go slowly through these, we see some air trapping that's not just in the dependent lung, but we see some out in the anterior upper lobe. And then you can see some lobular areas uh, away from the dependent areas. It's not as bad as I thought it would be, but I think, I mean, we got a large area there and probably some here in the lingula as well. And then just patchy lobules. So, and not so much in the basis. So uh, this is presumably constrictive bronchiolitis from rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I, I don't know if it's as common as the literature claims. Uh, many of the older papers were written in the time of gold salts and oh, um, what was that drug they used? Penicillamine, which I believe penicillamine can even cause constrictive bronchiolitis, so unclear, but uh, it does occur. Uh, still in some patients and can be the only manifestation in the chest. 
And then this is a fascinating case. I'm very curious what Howard and David think about this one. So this patient um, has scleroderma. Uh, this is what uh, she looked like back in 2011. Um, she had very, very mild disease. You can see here she's got a fluid level of her esophagus and had some early sort of uh, dependent opacities, not typical of atelectasis, but some of it maybe was, but they did do some prone imaging at that time, which shows that these are real. So the so-called interstitial lung abnormalities, if you like that term, but some non-dependent ground glass opacity. So maybe some very early um, parenchymal lung disease. There, It almost looks a little bit like it's arcading a little bit. So now we fast forward um, to now, and and the scleroderma case diagnosis is, is firm. There's no question, oops, sorry about, about that diagnosis, but the pattern of lung disease is actually quite strange. I would have expected it to progress to an NSIP pattern, um, but what we really have here is a pattern of pulmonary ossification. I mean, there's definitely fibrosis, but it's there's a lot of this pulmonary ossification. You can see how dense all this is. So my theory is, and I'm tell me if you guys think otherwise, that there's probably been a lot of aspiration since these, these original scan was done 10 years ago, and that most of this fibrosis is probably related to that, hence the pulmonary ossification, and, and, and may not be related to the scleroderma itself. Yeah, that's very interesting. I've not, I have heard about the reported association between chronic aspiration and pulmonary dendriform ossifications. I, I don't know if it's a thing, but certainly I've heard people talk about it, and I think pathologists sometimes talk about that, mm -hmm. and it's an attractive explanation for a case like this, I think. Right, because I've not seen pulmonary ossification associated with connective tissue disease. I mean, we've seen it in patients with sort of an indolent fibrosis that looks like UIP, and there have been papers that associate it more with a UIP pattern, which this isn't. Um, it's very dependent, um, and there's clearly esophageal issues, but I've not, I mean, I've seen plenty of scleroderma associated yeah. with fibrosis cases, but never one with pulmonary ossification that I recall. Well, right. I, I've seen it, Jeff. <laughs> of course you have. Right, and um, you know, you can even, you can see pulmonary ossification in people who've had infections. So if once you stimulate the fibroblasts, some of those probably turn into osteoblasts and they start laying down bone. So it doesn't surprise me. And I, I have seen it in NSIP patterns. Um, I used to think that it required chronicity and it doesn't because I've seen it develop, you know, in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And some people, it's not necessarily a chronic thing. So um, I don't, I've seen it with an NSIP pattern. and. To, to me, most of this, most of this fibrosis is way out at the periphery. Right. It's not really the, around the central airways, which goes better for aspiration. So I think this is just progression of, of um, you know, an NSIP pattern. There's some nice subpleural sparing back there. Yeah, a little right there. And uh, yeah, and uh, I think this is, uh, I think it just goes with the uh, fibrosis. And I, I don't think there's, you can, you know, you can even see it with asbestosis. Mm -hmm. So, from pulmonary ossification, any cause of lung fibrosis can, some of it flips into uh, laying down bone rather than fibrous tissue. So, it doesn't surprise me. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I just, yeah, I was not expecting to see this, uh, going like seeing this one and then going back to see what it came from because um, there, I don't, yeah, interesting. Okay. Well, that is, uh, let's see, that is all I have this week. Are you ready, David? I think I'm ready. All right, I'll make you the presenter. So I have a feeling I may have shown this case before, but um, lipoma is the most common tumor of the diaphragm, but I've not seen very many cases. There aren't that many <laughs> diaphragm tumors to begin with. But here's an example. We have an older abdominal CT. This is 2014 that shows this lipoma in the um, peri part of the diaphragm. And then a few years later, 
this uh, this exam being 2019, about five years later, the lipoma has gotten bigger. It's completely surrounded by some muscle, I think, although it's very, very thin here. So I don't think that this is just, say, a little herniation of the abdominal fat into the into the fibers. I think this is really located solely within the um, the muscle itself. So here's a di diaphragm lipoma. If this is familiar, I apologize for showing it twice, but you know, you got to rejoice whenever you find a diaphragm tumor. So, okay. Dave, yeah, I don't remember this one from you. I may not have been there that week, but um, remember I showed that case it was, it was a few months ago that of more of a more heterogeneous fatty lesion in the diaphragm, and you had sent me, you had said it was a, right. a lipoma and sent me an article, but yours is nice and clean and right. That. But I think yours qualifies as an intramuscular lipoma. So mm -hmm. I, yeah, I was fascinated by that case. I looked up a bunch of stuff. And there, there was, there is some literature for that intramuscular pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you basically you have the the fatty tissue um, sort of extending along the the muscle fibers and separating them. So it's a mix of muscle strands with um, with fat. Um, so, yeah, that was intramuscular. And I've seen those intramuscular li lipomas in the chest wall before, where they're mixed in with uh, intercostal muscle okay so intramuscular pattern Th this one is just a more ordinary lipoma Be yeah your case was great yours is too okay well thank you we, we all like each other's cases that's very good okay um so i hope this uh works here um so here's a woman who um uh, has a long history with uh, stem cell transplantation and this is a remote chest radiograph this is back in or this is early in uh, in 2021 so at and uh, let me show you a ct from this era because she's got a lot of respiratory issues with her stem cell transplantation she has constrictive bronchiolitis and you can see that she's got some mosaic attenuation air trapping here pretty extensive actually in lower lobes accompanying a large airways disease in the in the form of bronchial wall thickening and a little bit of bronchiectasis. The small airways disease is what's causing this, all the lucency. That's actually the more severe component. The bronchiectasis is um, not that symptomatic and it comes later. So initially you get the constrictive bronchiolitis, you get the small airways disease, and that's what makes people short of breath. Eventually, almost everybody with constrictive bronchiolitis gets large airways disease and that's bronchiectasis. And it's not so important, but it's uh, often what people pick up. Okay, um, and then let me fast forward to current imaging now. So this is this month. You can see that she's developed a lot of upper lung disease here. And I'd just like to remind you that this is the era of COVID. And so that would be a consideration. And we've had a number of our stem cell transplant people get COVID. And so here she has this widespread ground glassy, uh, upper lung predominant um, abnormality here. So this is not just an accentuation of her mosaic attenuation. This is actually coronavirus infection. But mm. this is not COVID. So this is a seasonal, human seasonal coronavirus. Um, so this is an ordinary coronavirus. In a normal person, this would probably just cause you a cold. It wouldn't get into the lungs. You know, we've not seen that much coronavirus pneumonia. We have seen occasional cases, but we don't see that much in, in the lung itself. But this is a non-COVID coronavirus. So is this the one that uh, begins with the letter O? I can't remember, like OC something. No, they're calling it LRTI or LTRI or something like that. I haven't looked at that abbreviation. The, the stem cell transplant people are calling it human seasonal coronavirus. That's what they said they were instructed to call it. So that's what I'm going to call it. I, I'll see if there's a more specific uh, species that I can I can relate to you guys. It's interesting. Okay, so here's that, um, our state um, health department sent an email out earlier this week saying there's been a huge increase in respiratory and non-COVID respiratory infections of bugs that we typically don't see like RSV, parainfluenza, and one of these coronaviruses that causes colds usually in the winter. And I, 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 and 
and I don't know, I and mean, there was that big RSV outbreak in the Southeast, uh, but I didn't know, if, but it's just, it, it's, I was trying to figure out why this was going on, why we're seeing all these winter viruses in July and June in the upper Midwest where it can be pretty warm. And I don't know if it's just people are congregating again and they didn't get immunity from it, getting it in January, so it's just sort of delayed. I presume you're seeing similar things or hearing about similar things. No, I'm not. I, so that's very interesting. Because, you know, influenza was really suppressed this last year because the little kids weren't in school to pass it around. It turns out the spread of influenza is mostly dependent on children who then take it home to their their parents and grandparents. So um, when, when you close the schools, you basically shut down influenza right. for the season. But the other virus that took a big, a big um, decrement, too, was RSV. So I, I like your I like your hypothesis that people didn't boost their seasonal immunity, and now that they're congregating again, and their kids are uh, playing with each other and stuff like that, they're they're getting what they should have had in the winter because they didn't uh, you know bump up their immunity every year. So yeah, I like I like that hypothesis. Yeah, I was just looking okay. at the, the news release. It hasn't been linked to any specific like facilities or anything, so it's just kind of running ramp it but I think that's what's going on is the the kids yeah we had like no influenza here this year barely any I don't recall any admissions or very few so yeah it was a non-season um, so you know people when coronavirus first hit when once you know COVID hit people assumed that it would behave the way influenza behaved but it turns out that the transmission is really different mm -hmm. so you know, children are critical for influenza but uh, children have not been that important with uh, with COVID, so right. well, it really is a different pattern of transmission. For sure. Okay, so um, here's an older woman, 92 years old, and this was a radiograph from um, May. Um, she's got a lot of a lot of chronic problems and has this abnormal chest radiograph. I don't know what's going on in here in this around the right hilum and stuff like that. But then. Um, then she came in um, to the hospital looking like this over the weekend. So you might ask yourself, what is all this blotchy stuff that seems to be everywhere? I mean, you know, did they dump a load of uh, gravel on her or something like that? But it turns out that this is part of her diagnosis. So this 92 year old woman was found found down in her uh, in her bedroom uh, with funny respiration and stuff like that, and her temperature was 103. So we've had a heat wave in the Northwest, and uh, temperatures got up to 109 or 108 in Seattle on the weekend, which is just incredible. It shattered all the records. It's about 30 degrees warmer than normal, more than 30. And this is all ice, these are all ice cubes. So they brought her in packed in ice, um, I've, I've seen a couple of other admissions this weekend, and what they would do is they, they didn't pack it over the chest the way they did in this person, but they had it around the arms. So they had these ice ice packs on the arms. They did, didn't hit the central part of the body in that other patient that I saw from Saturday or Sunday. But this is all; these are all ice chips here. And her, um, she was she had a cardiac arrest. They attributed it to hyperthermia. She had a CT scan, which um, shows a lot of ground glass but nothing that you can really grab hold of plural effusions and stuff like that and um, she did not survive so this 92 year old woman was dispatched by the heat um, she was in a in a building that did not have air conditioning very few i think less than a third of people in seattle have air conditioning in their houses it's more frequent now than it used to be but people didn't ever used to have to think about air conditioning um, <clears throat> We thought about it, and we've actually installed limited air conditioning in our house now because the summers are definitely getting warmer. Okay, so this was hyperthermia, cardiac arrest, and then she succumbed. Wow. And um, then I would like to show you this um, this person who came in short of breath and uh, diarrhea for the last uh, four to six weeks and stuff like that, and has this. Um, low lung volume, 
maybe some basal consolidation, maybe just atelectasis down there. She had a CT scan around that time. This is also from mid-May. And you can see that she really does have a ground glass abnormality. It's um, concentrated in the bases. So not a bad, not a bad aspiration distribution, this sort of central bases around the bigger airways and fading toward the periphery. That's what I that's what I associate with aspiration. Um, you know, she got more short of breath and her chest radiograph began to look more obviously abnormal and had um, a follow-up CT that shows truly extensive ground glass basal predominant. So just a ton of ground glass. It's got a big heart. This doesn't look like edema. So this, you know, strongly basal ground glass. And there are some, there is some edema associated with this, some septal lines up here, but I don't think this pattern is, is edema. So it turns out that this is pneumocystis. So pneumocystis is usually mid and upper lung predominant. Here's a case where it's basal predominant. They didn't find any other pathogens and they observed that her lymphocyte count was very low, like 26. And this was a presentation of um, HIV AIDS. So pneumocystis, the diarrhea is part of often, that, often that, that is a presenting finding in people who have um, HIV AIDS. So she's now on therapy and uh, she's starting to clear this stuff up. So pneumocystis, the unusual thing for pneumocystis is the basal predominance in this case. That would really push me away from that diagnosis. Very unusual. Yeah. And um, let me show you this, um, this patient who on an abdominal CT in this era has, well, let me show you the, let me bring up the abdomen alongside this. Okay, so for comparison to this current radiograph, um, let me show you this abdominal CT, which shows, just for reference, a, a pretty clear lower part of the right middle lobe. So we don't really go high enough to make a comparison with this, but you can see that the middle lobe got um, very abnormal. Uh, in the interim. So we've got this consolidation with very nice air bronchograms, and there's um, bulky mediastinal abnormality here. Uh, looks like a lot of lymphadenopathy. It's kind of all over the place. Some of it might have some low attenuation, but it's not markedly so. And it turns out this is Mycobacterium avium uh, causing this pneumonia here, and uh, there's a, and a lot of lymphadenopathy. And this is also a woman with um, HIV AIDS. Her AIDS was under good control, um, but she did develop mycobacterial infection. So this is one of the most common infections in, in HIV AIDS. This is uh, atypical mycobacterial infection, it's MAI. So it's widespread, it's a cause of lymphadenopathy, uh, often low attenuation lymphadenopathy, the way TB lymphadenopathy can have low attenuation because of caseous necrosis. And she had a pneumonia component to it too. So I don't think this middle lobe is obstructive. This is not a post-obstructive pneumonia because, it, well, you know, there is some narrowing proximally there, but on bronchoscopy, they got uh, MAI out of this. So known, one of the known diseases, you know, this is late in her course. I mean, she was uh, pretty well controlled. So you'd think that she would have enough immunity um, to handle MAI, but I, I guess her immunity is not, not 100% of a normal person's immunity, and so she is still susceptible. Okay. Wow. That's dramatic. Dramatic lymph node involvement encasing airways. Wow. Right. Even in the central right lower lobe, between those origins of the basal segmental bronchi, there's a lot of abnormal tissue. It's yeah, I just... just Stands yes. out. Uh, yeah. Gosh. Okay, guys, those are those Thank are my you. cases. Great. Very dramatic. All right. Well, we'll end a little early today. Thank yeah. you, everyone, and I will yeah. talk to you next week. Have a good yeah. holiday weekend if you if you have a holiday on Monday or however it works. Thanks, everyone. All right.
Bye. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.